Football is a funny old game. Sometimes things that seem terrible in the moment can turn out to be enormous blessings in disguise. The same, of course, can be true of life. It is often out of chaos and tragedy that beauty is born, and presumably channeling that very Nietzschean train of thought, subscriber I'm Dangerous recently suggested that I do a video about injuries which pave the way for superstars. I'm not quite sure how dangerous I'm Dangerous really is, but during these worrying times, I wasn't about to take any risks, so I decided to oblige. Also, I quite like the idea myself, so thanks I'm Dangerous. As always, feel free to leave your own video ideas in the comments or on Twitter. We didn't get the nickname The People's Channel for nothing. And especially, if your suggestion gets a fair few likes, the odds of me seeing it are pretty high. Oh, and make sure you are subscribed to HITC7s, of course. We hit a quarter of a million subs at the weekend, and once I hit 300,000, I'm told there'll be some kind of collaboration with me and the Irish guy, in case that's any incentive. Before I start, these are just a random seven. Obviously, it's fairly common for a young player to get their chance due to an injury to a more established player, but these are just some notable or interesting examples for your viewing pleasure. Here are seven injuries that paved the way for superstars. Paul Parker and Gary Neville Football fans of a certain vintage, roughly a quarter of my usual audience if the YouTube analytics are to be believed, will be old enough to remember the Manchester United back four of the early to mid-1990s. Their back four, from right to left, read Paul Parker, Steve Bruce, Gary Pallister, and Dennis Irwin, with Peter Schmeichel in goal. It was a formidable back line, and one that Sir Alex Ferguson was understandably reluctant to break up. Gary Neville was part of Manchester United's famed class of 92, but unlike Ryan Giggs, he didn't immediately waltz into the United first team. Across both the 1992-93 and 1993-94 seasons, Neville only played in three first-team games for Manchester United and made just a solitary appearance in the Premier League. Paul Parker played in 40 of United's 42 Premier League games in the 93-94 campaign before being struck down by injury. Parker's injury problems persisted as Gary Neville was given his first taste of regular first-team football. Neville was still rotated in the 1994-95 season, with Fergie sometimes playing Dennis Irwin at right back and Lee Sharp at left back, but from the 1995-96 season onwards, Neville was among the first names on the team sheet at Old Trafford. He went on to become a one-club man, making over 600 appearances for the club and winning 85 caps for England. Neville won eight Premier League titles and two Champions League titles. Meanwhile, Parker later played for Derby County, Sheffield United and Fulham, but continued to struggle to find fitness. René Bliard and Juste Fontaine Whilst I should think it's quite likely a number of you will have heard of Juste Fontaine, especially those of you who subscribe to this channel, I suspect very few of you have heard of René Bliard. And yet, going into the 1958 World Cup, it was Bliard who was France's first choice centre forward. Bliard and Fontaine were teammates at Stade de Reims, who were the strongest team in France at the time, winning a League Cup double in 1958. In the 1958 Coupe de France final, Rems's fantastic front four ran show for all to watch, with René Bliard scoring twice and Juste Fontaine once in a 3-1 win against Nîmes. The Rems manager at the time was former French international Albert Bato, who also managed France's national team. Whilst he played both Bliard and Fontaine at Rems, he had the likes of Real Madrid star Francisco Hento and Lens sensation Marian Wisniewski to choose from with the national team. As such, Bateau was only expected to start one of his club duo in the World Cup, and in all the warm-up games, he had opted for Bliard. In France's final pre-tournament fixture, though, Bliard was injured and ruled out for the entire tournament. Juste Fontaine stepped in, having only ever won three caps prior to the finals, and the rest, as they say, is history. Fontaine scored 13 goals in just six matches at the 1958 World Cup, the most goals ever scored by a player at a single finals, and enough to put him fourth across all World Cups, despite only featuring in one finals. Overall, Fontaine scored a stunning 30 goals from 21 caps for France, whilst Bliard never won a cap for France after 1958 and left Rems in 1959. Anthony Martial and Marcus Rashford a much more recent example, but another entry featuring a Frenchman, Marcus Rashford, has a pre-match injury to Anthony Martial to thank for him making his Manchester United debut. Martial was set to start for the Red Devils in early 2016 for Europa League tie with Midtjylland, but an injury during the warm-up forced Louis van Gaal into finding a replacement. It was actually a couple of injuries that paved the way for Rashford, since fellow youngster Will Keane would have stepped in for Martial had he not also picked up an injury that week. Rashford was selected by Van Gaal as a last resort, but he bagged a brace and earned rave reviews. The following weekend, he made his Premier League debut and scored another brace, this time against Arsenal, and the following month, he scored the winner against Man City at the Etihad. Rashford ended the season with eight goals in 18 games. 
He had been highly rated at Old Trafford for a number of years, and his breakthrough may have been inevitable, but it's impossible to know what the full impact of that brilliant debut and first few weeks in the Manchester United first team were on the young goalgetter. Now aged 22, Rashford is Man United's chief goalscorer now, having scored an impressive 19 goals in 31 games so far this season. Roberto Baggio and Alessandro Del Piero We're not messing around in fourth place with two of the finest Italian footballers to have ever graced the sport. In many people's eyes, Roberto Baggio was the greatest Italian footballer of all time, and he spent more time playing for Juventus than any other club. The Divine Ponytail arrived in Turin controversially in 1990, and over the next five seasons, he scored 115 goals in 200 games, a ludicrous record for a number 10. Baggio's brilliance had made it difficult for a supremely gifted young number 10 named Alessandro Del Piero to break into the Juve first team. Del Piero made just 11 Serie A appearances in his first season with the club, despite impressing when he was handed a chance, but Baggio's wizardry showed no signs of letting up. Just a few months into Marcelo Lippi's tenure as Juventus boss, in November 1994, Baggio was ruled out for three months. Del Piero stepped in and was superb, helping Juve to their first Scudetto in nine years. Upon his return, Baggio suffered a second setback, and in the summer of 1995, Marcelo Lippi stated that Baggio was no longer part of his plans, and the Juve would focus their attention on the young man Del Piero. Baggio departed for AC Milan and continued to light up Serie A into the early 2000s, whilst Del Piero spent almost his entire career with Juventus, becoming the club's all-time record appearance holder and goalscorer. Jimmy Greaves and Jeff Hurst there's a faint whiff of the Bliard Fontaine situation with this one, as the more fancied centre forward picked up an injury that would prove significant at a World Cup. Jimmy Greaves is quite simply the greatest centre forward that English football has ever produced, and one of the finest any country has ever produced. From the age of about 15, it was clear that Jimmy was something special, and he comfortably ranks among the finest teenage footballers of all time. He made his England debut in 1959, age 19, and went on to score 44 goals from 57 caps for the three lines. By the time the 1966 World Cup came around, England's first World Cup on home soil, Greaves was aged 26. The 1965-66 season was a tough one for Greaves, as he missed three months of the campaign due to hepatitis, and there were doubts about whether he'd make the World Cup at all. He did enough to convince Alf Ramsey he was fit in England's warm-up games, and played in every group game as England progressed. However, in the final Greek game against France, Joseph Bennell raked his studs down Greaves' shin, leaving a scar and an injury requiring 14 stitches. West Ham striker Jeff Hurst replaced Greaves, and he went on to score in every knockout tie, including a hat-trick in the final, as England won their first World Cup. Hurst became a superstar overnight, he etched his name in history, and he is now Sir Jeff Hurst. Greavesy is still just Greavesy never having been offered a knighthood, but he ought to be forever remembered as the finest forward this nation has ever seen. Nathaniel Klein and Trent Alexander-Arnold Jumping back into the modern game, one could make the case that there is no finer right back in world football right now than Trent Alexander-Arnold. Certainly, in an attacking sense, the young Liverpool fullback is seriously special, and he has already played 125 games for the Reds at the age of 21. Alexander-Arnold's breakthrough wasn't a given though, since whilst he was very highly thought of in the Liverpool youth ranks, Jurgen Klopp had a very good senior right-back who looked like he would hold down that position for years to come. Nathaniel Klein joined Liverpool from Southampton and had a very good debut campaign at a time when he was a strong candidate as England's starting right-back. Klein made a whopping 52 appearances in his debut campaign and 41 in his second season with the club, but prior to the 2017-18 season, he suffered a back injury. Trent Alexander-Arnold, who had been handed his first taste of first-team football the previous season, was now Jurgen Klopp's first-choice right-back. The young lad from Merseyside stepped up to the plate and made 33 appearances, scoring a memorable free-kick against Hoffenheim in the Champions League. He was rotated at times and had some tricky defensive displays, but the following season he rarely made the position his own. Alexander-Arnold has just got better and better since Klein was first sidelined, and it would take an injury to the England international, and maybe even James Milner and Joe Gomez, for Klein to worm his way back into the Reds' starting eleven once again. Dion Dublin and Eric Cantona The standout example of an injury paving the way for a superstar off the top of my head was the injury to Dion Dublin at Manchester United in the early 1990s. Dublin had been signed by Alex Ferguson following a prolific stint at Cambridge United in 1992, himself a backup option after the Red Devils missed out to Blackburn Rovers on the signing of Alan Shearer. Dublin was a really good centre forward, but just a month into his debut campaign, he suffered a broken leg in a game against Crystal Palace at Old Trafford. 
The setback forced Ferguson to delve back into the transfer market, and there he found eccentric Leeds United forward Eric Cantona. There was a risk involved in signing Cantona, he had been considered someone who rocked the boat in the Leeds dressing room, hence why they were willing to sell him for £1.2 million. The Frenchman didn't behave impeccably during his time at Old Trafford, but he brought a lot more good than bad. Alex Ferguson described him as one of only four world-class players he ever had at Manchester United, and Cantona's infectious personality and arrogance on the pitch kick-started an era of dominance at Manchester United. Cantona won United's Player of the Year award twice in five seasons, also winning four league titles, before announcing an early retirement from the sport. That's it for today's video, thank you all for watching, smash the like button if you enjoyed it, and as always, do make sure that you are subscribed to HITC7s.